That's pretty, huh? I got a question. What do you do when some dude you idiotically gave your number to in your 20s? So like, probably 2004 is still intermittently calling you. What do you do? I have his number saved as something something asshole in my phone and this time I just threatened him with legal action. He hung up real quick. Will it stop? Ugh. So anyway, um, I still want to do the video that I was planning on for today. And uh, no, this is not sponsored whatsoever. I am, uh, I put in my order from these guys again. I like to go with family owned. <clears throat> and it's interesting because a lot of the ones that used to be family owned, uh, got bought out by Gardens Direct, I think it's called. So little ones like Gurney's and Spring Hill Nursery and the ones that are usually sending you catalogs are all and all owned by this big mega company that actually does all the growing and distributing. And um, on those ones that are owned by them, I have yet to figure out how to tell. Uh, the packaging isn't so great anymore. I definitely did used to go with those catalogs in the past, and I had really good experiences, but it just tanked recently. So, uh, you know, heads up. Oh, and looky, there's mushrooms. Does anybody know edible mushrooms that fruit in the winter like this? Cause that's freaking awesome. I know they're not edible, or if they are, they're not closely identifiable enough to figure that out. They're cute, though. Those ones are all over the place. That's Mushrooms are really, really good news about the soil. So... You see all those flags on it? That is how I say what I'm ordering. And I also kind of want to talk about, like, my decision process and how I decide what I want. I love when a company sends me a catalog. I love that. Like, my bedroom ends up, I don't sleep well, I go through the whole dang thing. Love it. So... Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. Sorry about the train. So pretty. Maybe we'll do it this angle. Yeah, there we go. Get a little bit of the background in. So one of the things I've been thinking is my strawberries aren't doing as well lately. And you can see why I chose this one here. Apparently, if I get close, it gets blurry. Ability to fruit on its runner plants. I love an ever-bearing strawberry. However, having to chase after the runners in order for it to fruit more is really just too much for me. So that is a really positive thing, and I'm going to repopulate my strawberries. I also was thinking other small fruit thornless. So this is a primocane, which means it it fruits in both spring and fall on both old and new canes through zone five at least. Uh, and if you're in a colder zone, it'll still fruit on its new canes, which is really, really good too. So I decided to get this one because it's thornless and it's primo cane. And I'm really enjoying having the thornless brambleberries because then, and so here's another thornless that I'm adding. So these, these are a depart, well, these are a department of agriculture product. And so even though it's patented, they're not as picky about it. These ones, I would not be able to resale for definite. 
All right. So anytime that there is a patent number, which is what that PP number is on plants, if you're thinking about resale as a nursery, you would need to follow up with the original grower before you could. I decided Prime Gym also, oh, here's another thing. The, uh, I chose Primark over this one, Baby Cakes, partly because it's from the Department of Agriculture and partly because it is described as being similar to Rubus Pennsylvanicus, and I'm in Pennsylvania. So though they don't know exactly the lineage, it has similar traits and similar looking genetics to the native one. And this one also has native genetics in it. So I went with that. And of course you'll get to see their whole freaking catalog at this point because I'm afraid I'm gonna skip one. Here we go. So here's one. Rubus arcticus is a Canada native, so that's nice. It's I was not able to look up this particular Stella arcticus. I wasn't able to look that up at all. Like Rubus Stella arcticus isn't really a thing. So while this was bred in Sweden, it has the native lineage to it from the best I can tell. The only thing that came up for Stella arcticus was British, so maybe. But this plant only gets about six inches tall. It's a ground cover and it has full size raspberries from what they're describing. So that's really something I wanted to try. Did I get some pages sticking together? Yep. I decided since there were more things in here that I wanted to go with the more tried and true or at least more talked about meter American persimmon. It is generally more openly. This is an American persimmon. Diospyros, don't know how to say it, Virginiana. Um, and it, these are the ones that get real tall. You can prune them harshly if you want to. Uh, they have the hardiness down to zone five listed. And um, that's, that's some good stuff. You can see I circled some things I'm not getting. This was like narrow it down kind of stuff. I do already have this one, by the way. Ease right there. And I did get it from these guys, so it's the exact same thing. I would imagine. I don't know. Maybe they're growing them from seeds and there's diversity. Hard to say. Oh, come on now. Turn in the page, please. Please. My fingers are getting cold and it's getting harder to operate. Hmm. All right. Nothing off this page, though I considered Beautyberry. I don't think we're going to have anything for like a while. Here we go. So we'll just skip. There we go. This one has a lack of prickles. I've been wanting to get into zucchini again because it's such a good food producer and it's something I order frequently if I'm um, doing the like ordering food, grocery, grocery curbside or whatever the heck. I actually do the imperfect foods thing and I order zucchini a lot. So I thought that would be a good thing. And having them not be prickly sounds awfully nice because those spines do irritate my skin gonna hold off on that because I still don't have good enough acidic soil uh, to get a, an established plant going but I did decide to get an upright habit five to six foot tall native grass which is a heavy metal blue switchgrass and then so I do primarily I do native plant edibles and edibles that people might not know are edible. And so that's why we've just turned to the Hosta page and um, Hosta Cybaldiana elegans, but just Cybaldiana is one of the most prized edibles. So these are native to Japan and they're known in the, in the language there as being forest vegetables. So in the early spring, when they have those little spikes coming up, if you cut them off at the ground, you can grill them up, cook them, eat them. And they're, they're described as being like 
somewhere between a scallion and asparagus, which sounds pretty yummy to me. So that is something that I, I just want to get the word out. Just like daylilies are edible, I want people to understand that hostas are edible too. Really good vegetable you can put in. Oh, you can also eat the flowers on most of them too. Uh, so there is, they're all edible. However, three different species of them are listed as being the most delicious. And this is one of them, and it is a giant one, so the leaves get to be 18 inches wide. I will also hope to try having them as um, like a cooked vegetable wrap once the leaves are mature. That's something I'd like to try and see if it's good. I mean, it's not going to be toxic. It just might not be palatable. So those are orders I got on the way for spring and I am super excited about. I am investing more money in the garden lately. Yes, you are noticing that and it is fun. It's enjoyable. I am loving it. Additionally, um, I, I got a notification on, on Facebook from the Experimental Farm Network that they had restocked seeds and so I ordered again because they had native thicket berry back in stock and literally I stopped in the middle of my work day and ordered that and by the end of my work day it was sold out so it's worth it this is why being really really on top of the specialty orders is super worth it um that's a native perennial food crop that kind of in creates invasive ish thickets of beans they're small and they're low production but is something that they're talking about like we could further develop this so that is something that is of great interest to me is getting native plants repopulated native plants are very important to the ecology of each region because the native bugs especially a lot of times cannot reproduce unless a certain species of plant is there for them to reproduce on we know this about milkweed but what a lot of uh, like that's common knowledge but what is not as common knowledge is that there are hundreds of insect species that it's like that and a lot of them are our native pollinators they'll pollinate anything so if you're super worried about like the bees planting native plants is our backup plan and it's a really important thing to sprinkle them in. And I, I think it's important to reintroduce knowledge that has been suppressed or um, portrayed as, as negative. You know, my family is from here. Well, 45 minutes that way. And they're from here in the sense of mid 1700s they were already in the pittsburgh region that makes them half french and it makes the other half english and it makes them colonizers and the idea of invasive plants being more valuable is a very british concept when you think about it and the reason for that i think culturally is that the british isles have about four native food crops and they're not very tasty because originally the british isles didn't really have much of a population humans came afterwards so it is a good thing to consider that the general feelings about plants natives versus oh this is a more valuable crop because it's exotic <sighs> maybe reframe that because we did have an entire entire food system here that 
those folks thought was just wild. Uh, there's writings from First Landfall, from Monsieur American himself, uh, and he's talking about there were fields of the sweetest grass you've ever tasted. Yeah, those were rice fields that were just left because you didn't have to be present to farm them. There were systems in place and the migration wasn't just picking through things that were growing naturally. It was selecting seeds for greater production and having full-fledged food breeding programs in place on this continent right from the start. So, um, they had stumbled upon a farming system that they simply didn't recognize. And I would like to help support not only our ecology, but the amplification of knowledge that could save us. So, uh, hey, if that's something you're into, welcome to the cliffside. This is permaculture. Take care. We'll talk about this again soon. Feel free to ask questions. Anything that you're curious about, any of the plants that I grow, native or otherwise, they're not all native, many of them. I, I do a balance of perennial food crops and native food crops. That's, that's what we're looking at. So this is, uh, this is the cliffside. Little access stairwell and all. All right, Yins. Oh, that's so pretty. Take care. Bye.